The scripture reading will be taken from Psalms 2, 7 through 9. Psalm 2, 7 through 9. I will declare the decree the Lord said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the inheritance, the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Many of the Psalms point to predict, prophesy the Christ. Many of the Psalms were written by David about a thousand years before Christ came. Christ was said to come in the lineage of David. Many of the Psalms then predict Christ. And we know that because in the New Testament a lot of the things that are said are said to fulfill what happened in the Psalms. When Jesus was on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27 verse 46. He was quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. On down through Psalm 22, you see other things that are references to the way that Christ was treated while he was on the cross. They pierced my hands and my feet, verse 16. They gambled for his clothing is in that psalm. And then sometimes there are psalms that we think might point to Jesus, but we're not exactly sure. Some people think that Psalm 23 points specifically to Jesus and then has application to all of us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. But we don't have an exact text in the New Testament that tells us that that is a fulfillment of Psalm 23. There might be things that fit, but we don't have an exact text that tells us so. Psalm 2 is riddled with messianic prophecies in only 12 verses. On several occasions in the New Testament, you have hints and direct statements that this happened so that this could be fulfilled. Psalm 2 could be fulfilled. First of all, in this psalm, you see the antagonism of the world toward the Christ and toward any kind of authority over them. People in the world, individuals, don't like people over them sometimes. We put up with it because those people might be our bosses and they get control our paychecks. We put up with it because people might have some sort of threat of punishment over us. But a lot of people in the world don't like some sort of authority. Now we as Christians ought to know better than that and we ought to appreciate the idea of authority for the structure that it gives us and because God gave it to us. There is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. But the way of the world is that many times people will just rebel against any kind of authority. Not only is that so with individuals, but it is also so with governments. People will lift themselves up to think that they are gods of their own lives, gods of their own morality, gods of their own directions. And also people will collectively gather together and lift up their government and think that their government is better than any God and they won't recognize that the God of heaven gave them the power and they will actually fight against the morals that the God of heaven has. That's what the subject of Psalm 2 is. First of all, in verses 1 through 3, you see the antagonism of the world. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The nations are angry. The nations are gathering together. You get the idea of a boiling pot of something. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? They're plotting something. It's not going to work out, but they're plotting it. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, but let's stop there. Because those two verses are quoted in the New Testament to tell us at least one fulfillment of them. The fulfillment of them came in the crucifixion of Christ. In Acts chapter 4, the apostles, Peter and John, are on trial. They've been preaching and they're told to not preach anymore and they go back and they start preaching some more eventually. But when they're first released from the custody of the Sanhedrin, they go to the other apostles and they lift up a prayer to God. In that prayer... They quote these two verses. O Lord, they say, you are God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who, by the mouth of your servant David, has said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The rulers took counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. And then they explained it after they 
after they quote those two verses in Acts chapter 4, they explain it. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, together with the Gentiles and the children of Israel, were gathered together to do what your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Herod was the king of the Jews. The Herods became kings of the Jews during intertestamental times. There's a lot of secular things that went on there. It was not in the lineage of David. It was not the way that God had predicted. The last one in the lineage of David on an earthly throne was Jehoiachin, and that was predicted and said in Jeremiah 22, verse 30. But these were political kings that had some alliance with the Roman government. Herod was the king of the Jews. Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor. There you had the representative of the Jews, the representative of the Gentiles. They were all gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, as this psalm says, in order to do what God's hand had determined before to be done. God knew it would happen. They didn't surprise him. They gathered together all of their forces in antagonism against the Holy One of Heaven, but he knew it. He knew it was coming. He prophesied it. Some people would say, well then, how can God hold them accountable for that? Well, God can know they're going to do something, but they still have free will to do it. They had their free will, they did it, and God would hold them accountable for it. That's one instance. That's the prime instance. That's the main fulfillment of this prophecy, is that the Jews, the Gentiles, came together to kill God's son, just as God had prophesied. The rulers took counsel together. The kings were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. But there might be, and I emphasize might be, I ask you to consider that there might be some other applications of this passage. After all, this was written a thousand years before Christ came. And there were many governments between this time and that time that rebelled against the God of heaven, even though Christ hadn't come yet. And maybe this has reference to some of them. Possibly. We'll see. Look what the reason they give for rebelling against the Christ is in verse 3. They rebel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now, if I understand the passage right, what it's saying is, the kings gathered together, the rulers gathered together against deity. And maybe that's the reason for the plural there. It's capitalized in some versions. That does, that's not in the original, but that means that the translators thought that it referred to deity. That might be too much commentary on their part, but maybe they're right also. So the kings gather together and they say, here, is, here are the bonds that God gives us. Here are the cords that God gives us. Let's cast them away. What I think that means is that many times people in history have felt like God's restrictions are too much. They don't want his morals. They don't want his rules. They don't want what he has to say. So let's get together. Let's get our governments together and we can overthrow everything that has a hint of godliness in it. And we can be free from everything that God wants us to do. We can have our rights to do whatever we want to do in license in immorality, in sexuality. I think it was Aldous Huxley, one of the Huxleys that was a propagandist for Charles Darwin that admitted, I've told you before, he admitted that the reason he liked the theory of evolution so much was that it did away with God. And the reason he liked to do away with God, he said, was because that freed us up in our sexuality. We could do whatever we wanted to do. Let's break our, their bonds in pieces and let's cast their cords from us. What people like that don't realize is that they've got it backwards. Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, Jesus said in John 8 verse 34. And Paul, and Paul said in Romans 6 verses 16 through 18, Do you not know that your slaves to one or the other either sin to obedience or vo or sin to death or obedience unto righteousness? Do you not know that you're slaves to one or the other? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and being set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. They have it all backwards. They think that God's laws are the slavery. God's laws are the freedom. God's laws allow societies to prosper. God's laws allow individuals to live their very best lives. 
The warnings are there for people who want to live otherwise. They don't heed them. They look like they're having fun for a while, but they end up in misery. And even if they should happen to die quickly in this life and not experience any kind of distraught and distress from their sin, they'll experience it in the next life. God is just and he sets the ways. He knows where our freedom is. How dare we lift ourselves up against him? But these nations do that. Paul said of, of the Gentiles in Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Well, they couldn't find the truth. They'd suppressed it so much. In the book of Amos, in the book of Hosea, later in the book of 2 Thessalonians, God said that when people don't want the truth, he'll allow it to be taken from them. He'll allow there to be a famine in the land of the truth. He'll allow them to close their eyes to it and have it be forgotten for generations to come. He'll allow that when people choose to reject him. And that's what Romans 1 verse 18 is saying. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. This is the antagonism of the world. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? It was vain to kill Christ because God raised him up three days later, showed who was who. They plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and let us cast their cords from us. Well, that antagonism of the world isn't going to stand. The answer of heaven is described in verses 4 through 6. Verse 4, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Now that's a picture that maybe has some limitations. And the way I'm going to illustrate it is a little bit opposite. Have you ever seen those movies where somebody's very powerful and somebody very weak but heroic stands up to this powerful person and the first thing the powerful but wicked person does is just laugh at him. <laughs> you think you're going to get away with that. Well, this is the opposite because God is good, always good, and there's a sense in which you don't want to think of God laughing at sin like that, but bear with the psalmist for a moment. The point he's making is that you can't. It just can't be done. They're plotting a vain thing. And he who sits in the heavens will see all their plots and all their schemes, and they'll all get together. All the forces of the world will gather together against Christ, and he'll say, <laughs> you got nothing. It would be kind of like... If I tried to gather a little football team here amongst the people, I get Austin and Jacob and Steve and Owen and Isaac and some of us, we gather a football team and we go challenge the Super Bowl champions to a backyard game of football with their first team. You know what they're going to do. <laughs> laugh. Laugh at us. But then if we pressed on, you know what would happen? They might get a little bit upset. <laughs> Stop bothering me, kids. <laughs> They might get a little bit upset at that. And that's what happens in verse 5 when the real emotion comes out. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. God says first, you got nothing against me. And then his wrath comes about because he won't take that kind of treatment. God is just. God is merciful. But when people will come against him like that and have no desire for repentance, no desire to do anything right about their lives, he will punish. He will speak against them in his wrath and he will distress them in his deep displeasure. Then, he says, yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You can't stop it. You can try to stop it. You can try to stop me, but you can't stop me. You can gather your nations and you can rally against the morals that God gives. In those days, you could gather the nations and rally against the God of Israel. You could rally against the God of Judah. You could rally against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it will not stand. It will not stand. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Turn, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 28. The prophet Ezekiel chapter 28. In 28, 29, uh, uh, 26, 27, and 28, rather, of, these, of this book, there is a proclamation against the metropolis of Tyre of that time. It was in Sidon in the northwest, uh, northwest of Israel and on the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. It was a great trading center, and man, they were rich. It was like the New York City of the day. But in Ezekiel 26, 27, and 28, God says, you put all your trust in your riches and your businesses, and you're going to fall. 
Then in Ezekiel 28, he talks specifically to the king, to the king of Tyre, or the prince of Tyre, the ruler of Tyre. Back then they had city-states, so it wouldn't be like the mayor of New York and the governor of New York and the New York State and then the president of the United States. It'd be the king of New York versus the king of Los Angeles or the king of Minneapolis. Well, he's talking to the king of Tyre at this time, the prince of Tyre, the ruler, the arch of Tyre. Here's what he says. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the gods, in the midst of the seas. That's what he was saying. Because he's, God says to him, because your heart is lifted up. And here's what you say. You say, I'm a God. Now maybe he wasn't saying that verbally. Maybe he was. You say, I am a God. And I sit in the midst of the seas. I sit in the seat of the gods. Because you say that, God says, yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Then there's sarcasm in verse 3. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that can be hidden from you. Daniel had been pretty close to contemporary about this time. With your wisdom and your understanding, you've gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. <laughs> yeah, you did really well, Prince of Tyre. You got all these riches all by yourself. I didn't do a thing for you. The sarcasm bleeds from this prophecy. Therefore... Thus says the Lord God, verse 6. We're away from the sarcasm and now to the plain talking again. Because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit, and you shall die the dearth of the slain in the midst of the seas. Will you still say, before him who slays you, I am a God. There's a man with his sword drawn ready to take off your head. Are you still going to proclaim to him, looking up at him from the ground, I'm a God. But you shall be a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. You don't lift yourself up as a God against the God. Even if you collectively do it with all nations together. One other passage I'd like you to see is in Jeremiah chapter 50. I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 25. We can't read the whole chapter, but I'd encourage you to read it at home. The first part of the chapter is really toward Judah. God tells Judah, because you've been so wicked, I've sent you my servants, the prophets, to try to straighten you out, but you wouldn't listen to them. Because you've been so wicked, I'm going to have to bring all the armies of the north against you. Babylon's going to come against you. Nebuchadnezzar's going to come against you. And you're going to be in captivity 70 years. But then he directs his attention to the other nations. Verse 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand. That's a common image in the prophets. And it's even in the book of Revelation. And sometimes in the Psalms, I think. A wine cup of fury. Because... Wine makes you drunk, and that's an abomination, and it's shame. Now, our culture treats it like it's something fun, but they don't show you the morning after, and they don't show you the shame that goes on. God knew the shame that it had, and so he mixed these metaphors a little bit, if you will. Here's my fury. Here's a wine cup. I'm going to make you drunk with my fury. Here's, take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink to whom the Lord sent me. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and its princes, to make them a desolation, an astonishment, a hissing, and a curse as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his princes, and all his people, all the mixed multitude, all the kings of the land of Uz, all the kings of the land of the Philistines. And he names their city-states, Ashkelon, Geza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod. Edom to the south of Israel, Moab to the east of Israel, Ammon also to the east, but a little farther north. All the kings of Tyre, all the kings of Sidon, and the kings which are on the coastlands, which are across the sea, Dedan, Tuma, Booz, and all who are in the farthest corners, all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mixed multitude who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, all the kings of the Medes, all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth, also the king of Shishak, that's Babylon, shall drink after them. Therefore, thus says, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
drink, be drunk, and vomit, fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup from your hand and drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, You shall certainly drink. For behold, I bring... I begin to bring calamity on the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth, says the Lord. I'm going to punish Jerusalem, and they're my people. Should you wicked people around go unpunished? You don't rally against the morals of God, no matter how powerful your governmental alliances might be. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in his deep in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath. He shall distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Remember Daniel chapter 2 prophesied there'd be four succeeding kingdoms. And during the time of the Roman kingdom, there'd be a spiritual kingdom represented by a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And it'd be set up during the days of that Roman kingdom. And that's Jesus Christ. Here's a prophecy. Yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You tried to stop him, but you couldn't stop him. He rules in his church. He's saying this a thousand years before the fact, but it was just as sure as if it had already happened. In verses 7 through 9, you see the authority given to the son. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. You might now recognize that verse because it's quoted in Hebrews chapter 1. After the Hebrews writer states all these great uh, the, these, these great superlatives about Christ. He's the heir of all things through whom God made the world. He's the express image of his person. He's the brightness of God's glory. And he's obtained a better inheritance than the angels. Then he sets out to say that Christ is better than the angels. The first argument that he uses is this. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Well, that's Psalm 2, verse 7. And then verse 8 is another messianic prophecy. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. Well Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says that Christ is the heir of all things. He created all things. He's the heir of all things. He's through all things. In him consists all things. Colossians 1 verse 17. I'll give you the ends of the earth for your possession. And then, and then you see in verse 9... These words, you shall break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Christ is going to rule all kingdoms, and none of them that rebel against him are going to be left standing. Now these words, like them, are used in Revelation 19. At the end of Revelation, when victory is being pictured with the, with the uh, descriptions that we have, you see a rider on a white horse whose name is Faithful and True. But he also has a name which nobody knows except with himself. And he also has a robe dipped in blood and has the name, the Word of God. And then toward the end of it, it says that he will rule them with a rod of iron. Revelation 11:15 said the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He's brought them all in. Well, this passage in Revelation 19 then says that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He'll rule them with a rod of iron, Revelation 19.15 says. Then you want to see a little bit more about that. Look back in Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. In Revelation 2 and 3, Revelation 2 and 3, the churches of Asia are being spoken to. And the church of Thyatira had some serious moral problems. But there were some people there who were still faithful and trying to overcome. And so the Lord says to them in Revelation 2, 26 and 27... To him who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, I will give him power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall break them in pieces out of potter's, as a potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. There's the promise for Christians. You may be in an immoral city, and you may be under an immoral government, but you will win the victory. As I've received from my Father... Jesus said, I'll give it to you. You'll rule with a rod of iron. You'll break them in pieces like a potter's vessel thrown up against a wall. That is the authority given to the Son, and he's able to pass it on to those who follow him. Then lastly in this psalm, notice 
the acknowledgement of the Son, the encouragement to acknowledge the Son. Now, therefore, because of all that, because the kings of the earth gathered themselves and said, let's cast off the cords and break the bonds in pieces, and because God wouldn't have any of that but laughed at them and then showed his wrath toward them, and because God still set his Son on the throne, and because his Son's going to rule with a rod of iron, because all of all of that, verse 10, now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Isn't that odd? Rejoice with trembling. People don't put fear and trembling together with joy, but it sure goes together in the Bible. It's a wondrously joyous thing to fear the Lord. And know then that you have some respect for the one who has the authority to do everything that he wants to do. Set up any government that he wants to have. Tear, raise up kingdoms and tear down kingdoms according to Daniel chapter 2 and 4 and Jeremiah chapter 18 verses 7 through 10. And there's no authority except from him. Remember Jesus said in John 19, 10 and 11 to Pilate, you would have no authority at all unless it had been given to you from above. Well, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Rejoice that you have a guideline. Rejoice that you have your morals. Rejoice that you have something to do that you know is right and you don't have to make it up on the fly. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son lest He be angry and you perish in the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Kiss the Son. Worship Him. Now you say, that sounds like a dictator. That sounds like Lenin, who took over and had to have all his pictures thrown throughout all the land because they didn't worship God anymore. They worshiped Lenin in Soviet Russia. Or it sounds like Hitler, that had, or Hussein, that had their pictures plastered up there. And everybody had to bow down and worship them. Well, it kind of sounds like that except for this. Saddam Hussein and Adolf Hitler and Vladimir Lenin all received their authority from God and they abused it and took it. They received their authority really from Jesus Christ too because he was there in the creation. All things were created through him. Here in Psalm 2, a thousand years before he came, God says that all nations are subject to him. And then here's the big thing that makes Christ different from all these others that you might say are just evil dictators. Christ came and died at the hands of those to whom he gave power to kill him. He gave them the power to kill him, and then he let them kill him. And he died so that you and I could overcome the immorality in the world. He self-sacrificed. He deserves our kiss and our worship out of fear and trembling, but even more so out of appreciation and love. Kiss the sun. If there's anybody that ever has a right to be angry for not being worshipped, it's Jesus Christ. For anybody that has a right to be angry because people won't listen to him, won't study his word, won't talk to him in prayer. For anybody that has a right to be angry, it's the one who gave himself completely for us. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But then watch the last phrase. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. That's what Jesus said to Thyatira. You overcome, keep my works to the end, you'll, you'll dash them to pieces with a rod of iron as I've received from my Father. You keep my works, you'll win. You'll have the victory. The nations rage. People are always going to be against God because they don't like what he has to say. But those things that he has to say are the right things, whether people like them or not. And those few of this earth who gather together themselves in the great minority and follow what he has to say, they're the ones that will be blessed in this life and in eternity. Now update that to New Testament times. Christ came. He died on the cross. He's still in charge of nations. He still has pre-appointed times and boundaries for everybody, Acts 17, 26. He still has that, but he's made things a lot more individual, or at least apparently individual, I'm sure every individual in the Old Covenant had to answer for himself as well. But things focus more on the individual now. And the individual can say, no matter what my government does, I'm going to be a part of the Lord's government, the church. It's not a threat to any earthly governments, but it's going to function with them. I'll be a part of his, his church, a congregation of the local Church of Christ, 
Because I'll believe in Jesus as the Son of God. I'll repent of my sins. I'll confess Him and I'll be baptized, born again into His kingdom for the remission of my sins. And I'll be faithful therein. Blessed are those who put their trust in Him. If you haven't been baptized or you need to come back to the Lord, please come tonight as we stand and sing. Almost persuaded now to it Almost persuaded Christ to receive Seems now some soul to say Go Spirit, go thy 